John Knoll, congratulations on your recent Academy Award nomination for Best Visual Effects for Rogue One. Uh, this is your sixth career nomination, and you've won before. Uh, so is it still a surprise every time that you get the news you've been nominated? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very competitive field. Uh, there's a lot of really excellent work being done. So, you know, there's no guarantee that, uh, you know, even amazing work will get, get nominated just because of the, the vast uh, volume of great work that's being done now. So, yeah, it's definitely, um, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful surprise in the morning to, uh, to wake up and see, see that we've um, gotten this honor. Well, congratulations again. Like I mentioned, you're a previous winner. You won for the second Pirates of the Caribbean film, Dead Man's Chest. Uh, so take us back to that night and, and, and let us uh, tell us what it was like uh, the night that you won and, and what that kind of recognition meant for you. Well, it was great, especially for the crew, um, because you know they, I've been on a bunch of very large projects, and you know it's very much a huge team effort, and people really pour their heart and soul into these projects, and and uh, uh, for me. Probably the, the best part of the whole thing was uh, getting back to work the next day and there's a gathering in the dining commons and uh, uh, just seeing the smiles on everybody's faces and how much it meant to, to everyone on the crew. That was super rewarding. So let's talk about Rogue One. You've worked within the Star Wars universe before. You did some visual effects work on the prequels. In mm -hmm. fact, two of your Oscar nominations came for uh, Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones. So going into this film, which is the first of what's going to be a series of standalone Star Wars films, what was the, um, I guess, thinking in, number one, distinguishing it from the other films, mm -hmm. but also making it a part of the overall universe? Well, one of the, the wonderful things about uh, what we're doing with the, the Star Wars stories is we get some freedom to depart from the style book. So... Uh, in terms of filmmaking uh, devices, not using wipes, um, going for more of a documentary style, uh, more naturalistic lighting. Uh, all of these things were kind of, I think, really fun opportunities to try and inject into Star Wars. Um, but at the same time, we, we've designed something that, that in its nature wants to meet right up to, to episode four. And so you don't want to be so different from that that it, feels like the films don't go together. So even though many of the same things that are depicted in our film and in, um, in New Hope, if you really compare them, they're quite a bit different. Um, I, I think they sort of match your memories, and that's kind of what we were trying to get, a more modern take on how you remember things. And so I, I feel like it was fairly successful in that regard. Right. Uh, speaking of linking it up to episode four, that brings us to probably the big special effects feat of the film. Um, and uh, for anybody who hasn't seen it yet, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going to give away something. Um, you bring back Peter Cushing and a young Princess Leia. Um, the decision to do that, um, I guess, why was that the best approach for this film as opposed to hiring another actor or, or something mm -hmm. like that? Uh, well, I feel like uh, it's it's a lot like depicting a historic figure in a film, mm -hmm. and there, when you're depicting a, a famous figure, somebody that you know very well, you have a choice of how you're going to do that. Um, you try and find an actor that's uh, that's close in resemblance and build to that person, um, and there's almost always some effort made to alter their appearance, whether it's a little bit of makeup or a lot of makeup. Um, and in this case, we're really doing the same thing conceptually. We cast an actor who, who we had to find somebody who's a good actor. We had to have, find somebody whose uh, physical build was something close um, and whose mannerisms were like the, uh, the person he's portraying. Um, and his voice is close enough that, that he could do voice as well. Um, and then rather than use a makeup to alter his appearance, we use computer graphics. Uh, it's a very sophisticated, uh, technologically complicated version of it, but essentially we're using computer graphics to change his appearance. Were you at all afraid that it would be too jarring the first time that audiences saw it? Or 
Was that at all a concern? I, I, I certainly have heard that reaction that people said, uh, you know, as soon as I saw him, um, that's all I could think about, and I was thrown out of the scene. Uh, and I, I understand I don't want to discount that that reaction, but to be honest, the, the movie is full of things that um, that aren't real. And for the very first thing you see, you're being presented with you know, planets in space and uh, and giant spaceships and all sorts of things that that uh, intellectually you know can't exist. So, you know, that, that is part of the, the whole essence of the film is it's full of fantastic things that don't exist and we're sort of asking you to, to bring some uh, suspension of disbelief. Right, absolutely. So then <clears throat> uh, let's, let's talk a bit more about the process of actually doing this. As you said, you hired an actor um, for part of this. Um, when it came to... Uh, I guess replacing his face with Peter Cushing. What was that process like? Um, well, you have to you have to capture what the the our actor is doing on set. So we used um, you know head mounted cameras. So we had uh, infrared cameras that were on a head rig in front of the actor's face that uh, captured the motion of his 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 face. Um, when we built a CG model of Peter Cushing from reference photographs and from a life cast that uh, that was done in 1983 for a Zucker Brothers film called Top Secret. Uh, so we got a scan of that and um, and used that as sort of a ground truth for proportions. But um, it was a great deal of of um, the work of, uh, of some really fine sculptors trying to really get that likeness nailed. Um, of course, you, you don't have Peter Cushing to take in and do a photo session to get uh, high resolution textures or to, to get the shape of his face. So that all has to be reconstructed by really talented artists. Um, we did use, uh, we scanned a couple of, uh, of older gentlemen that, uh, that had sort of similar complexion um, or were about the right age. And we used some of that for texture on his face. Um, and then the next part is, is trying to make a move in the, in the right way. And we could apply the motion from, from Guy Henry, from our actor, onto the model. And something we discovered that was probably the hardest part of the whole project was that um, Guy Henry moves his face in a way that's a bit different than Peter Cushing. And when he forms some of his phonemes, um, he does them in a, he moves different muscles in his face. And as an example, um, when Peter Cushing makes an ah sound, uh, he doesn't really move his upper lip. And he makes sort of a trapezoidal shape with his lower lip that exposes his whole lower row of teeth. And that's just not the way Guy Henry would make a, an ah sound. And even if you apply that motion onto, you know, perfect likeness of, of Peter Cushing, um, he literally will kind of push himself off model and it doesn't quite look like him anymore. It looks like, you know, his brother or, or some relative, but not necessarily like him anymore. So there was a lot of work involved in going in um, and modifying uh, mouth shapes to be a little bit more on character. Right, that technology sure has come a long way from uh almost 20 years ago when they were using it in Gladiator to put Oliver Reed's head on another actor when he had passed away. Um, when it came to Princess Leia, uh, like Carrie Fisher was still alive back then. Mm -hmm. So was that process a bit different of, of um, since she was still around? Uh, it was essentially the same process. Uh, the main difference from her being around was that um, you know she was aware that we were doing this, and right. uh, and Kathy Kennedy was pretty adamant that um, right, well, Kat, uh, Carrie's gonna gonna see this, and if she doesn't like it, we're not not gonna do it. Um, so that was I was hanging over us, um, but uh, I'm happy to say that that uh, you know we're fairly far in the process. Um, you know we showed it to Carrie, uh, and Kathy gave me a call after. Carrie had seen it and said, gosh, she loved it. She freaked out. She thought it was amazing. And her first question is, wait, is that, is that archival footage? <laughs> Made us all feel pretty happy. I thought the same thing when I watched it, actually. So it's, it's really quite impressive. Um, now, of course, within this, you've got 
all these other special effects uh, sequences that you have to design and execute, not the least of which are, you know, creating all these ships and uh, various aliens and things like that. So what were some of the uh, most complicated special effects sequences for you and your team? Uh, well, there are all different levels. Uh, uh, some complicated things, uh, the, the uh, ground level destruction of Jeddah. So when um, Death Star fires um, at uh, low power, we have this expanding shock wave that uh, destroys the whole area around Jeddah. And seeing that down from ground level and flying sort of through the, this overarching uh, shock wave um, was complicated sim work. Um, K2SO, a droid character in the movie, uh, is in you know, a great many shots. He's one of the uh, secondary characters of the film, and he's um, all computer generated throughout. Uh, I was very pleased with how well that turned out. Um, we had a lot of spaceships, you know, ships in, trans, uh, uh, in transit from one place to another and, and in our space battle. And uh, we wanted to make sure that the aesthetic of everything that we were doing kind of felt like it belonged in a, in a Star Wars movie. And an idea that, uh, that we had very early on was uh, because of the, the way that the models were built in the original film, uh, you know, being detailed through using little bits and pieces of plastic model kits, uh, yeah, that ended up being a big part of the aesthetic and why they looked like what they did. And we thought, why don't we get a bunch of the original plastic model kits, um, scan a bunch of the pieces, uh, make highly optimized digital versions of those, and then when our modelers are building something, they can work in the same way that the model makers did in the, the original day, sort of the digital analog of that, where they would pull parts out of the, our digital kit bashing library and detail up the models. And if they work that same way, then hopefully the aesthetic would transfer and our models would look like they belonged in that same universe. And I'm happy to say, I feel like that was really very successful, that uh, we've got a lot of comments from people who said that they, they thought the model work looked like um, motion control photography and that it just you know, fit right in. Right. Um, it, it, it's interesting, um, the ways in which special effects have evolved, and certainly the first Star Wars film is an example of uh, how far technology has gone uh, has come since then. Uh, I just want to ask what uh, got you into the field of visual effects uh, personally? Uh, well, Star Wars was pivotal. Um, when I was growing up, um, I was a big fan of the movies. Uh, and it's, I especially liked the technical aspects of filmmaking. And when you're seeing something in a film that had to have been manufactured imagery in some way, you know, you're seeing something that obviously they didn't go out and shoot on location. And how that was all done and the techniques they used uh, to realize those, uh, those worlds and those objects and creatures, uh, I think was super fascinating. And so films that were really influential as a kid were things like Forbidden Planet, Day the Earth Stood Still, um, the Harryhausen movies. Uh, 2001 was a big one for me. And then uh, uh, when, two, when Star Wars came out, uh, I was 14 years old and uh, it was a revolution. It was this amazing advance in the, in the technology and the realism of, of the work. And, and at 14, you're starting to think a little bit about uh, what do you want to do with the rest of your life. And, uh, and I'd been tinkering just to, with um, um, hobbyist uh, explorations of various special effects techniques. I did clay animation and I built miniatures and, and uh, that kind of thing. Um, but I wasn't really thinking of it as um, a career possibility until Star Wars came out. And suddenly, you know, this is an exciting new, a lot of new developments happening in the field. Um, and I started thinking maybe I would go into entertainment. So Star Wars is pretty directly responsible for my being here now. And to that end, I mean, are, are there still things that you learn with every film? Um, and uh, what specifically did you learn on this one? Uh, yeah, I think the best projects are, are projects where you learn. And if you, if you do something and you're not learning anything, I think it's kind of a missed opportunity. Uh, uh, 
well, we learned, we pushed in a lot of different areas on the, on the show. Um, I feel like I, I learned some good, useful things about uh, production methodology. We tried an experiment with uh, uh, image-based lighting on set with giant LED screens and preparing uh, computer graphics to play back on them to light the actors. I thought that was very successful. Um, doing digital humans is extremely difficult. It's one of the hardest problems in computer graphics. And I think we, we learned quite a lot from, from doing Tarkin and Leia that, that we can apply to projects going on in the, in the future. Looking forward to that. Well, it's very impressive work, John Noll. Thank you so much. Congratulations on your, on your work you. and your nomination. Thank you.